Now, NDE Radio, a weekly exploration of near-death experiences and similar encounters with the other side. Now, here's your host, Lee Whitting. Welcome to NDE Radio with Lee Whitting. Whether you're listening on TalkZone, by podcast, through the archives of our ad-free shows on our YouTube channel, or connected through the incredible content of our Facebook page. It seems to me that all people who experience an NDE get the message to share the love they've seen, at least with family and friends. But our guest today, Lewis Brown Griggs, experienced an NDE centered on a command to deliver the message he was assigned to give. Lewis was raised in privileged circumstances and earned both an Amherst BA in political science and a Stanford MBA in entrepreneurial management. Recognizing his privileged position in our society contributed to his understanding of the role he was asked to fulfill to help heal the divisions between race and class by working to overcome those corporate practices that have stood in the way of societal healing. As a diversity and inclusion trainer, speaker, and coach, Lewis has spent some 40 years working with corporations, academic institutions, and government agencies, bringing in increased effectiveness to individuals, teams, and organizations as a whole. In addition, Lewis became a certified professional co-active leadership coach and for a decade has led and facilitated spiritual groups after having recovered and learned much from, since his COVID incident, uh, his three near-death experiences. For his decades of work in the diversity and inclusion field, Lewis has received the Pioneer in Diversity Award and was formally recognized as a legend in diversity. He is the co-author of two books, Going International, How to Make Friends and Deal Effectively in the Global Marketplace from Random House, and Valuing Diversity, New Tools for a New Reality from McGraw-Hill. He is also the executive producer of the video series titled Going International, Valuing Diversity, Valuing Relationship, and Human Energy at Work, the three-part No Potential Lost interactive multimedia series, and the subsequent intranet e-learning program, The Potential is Yours. Lewis Brown Griggs, welcome to NDE Radio. <laughs> Thanks, Lee. It's fun to hear such a wise introduction. I got to meet that guy. <laughs> I know, I know. You probably will uh, sooner or later. We always meet up with ourselves. I think. <laughs> it's rather endless. That's where all the learning is, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Lewis, you were born into an affluent family. So as a white male in America, you were conscious of and confident in your status from an early age. So tell our listeners what growing up in that privileged social environment is like. And you can even compare it to your summer working on the railroad <laughs> <laughs> and how you avoided getting trapped by that privileged society. Wow, what a great question. So growing up in it, of course, I didn't have the consciousness I have now. So in hindsight, let me tell you that what it was like growing up in it was wonderful. When I heard a Black friend in here in Berkeley in Oakland recently say, I just want you to know that before I start this session, I never my once one, never once in my life have I experienced 100% uh, equity and fairness. And that enabled me to answer your question today, Lee, by saying, wow, that made me realize never in my life for one minute did I experience anything but 100% what I perceived, what I experienced as fairness and equity only to learn later that I was one of the few who was so lucky, okay? And so growing up with that kind of privilege, I, I, there was not for me or, or for my family arrogance or righteousness. Uh, there was, but there was gratitude and luck. I, I was told growing up, we're all one under God, but here you're better than, and they didn't mean my soul was better, they meant with all this privilege, you have to give back, noblesse oblige, and you have better access. And so I did grow up at least with the consciousness of that. And yet I became aware, for instance, in a terrible moment, we all were, will never forget watching the knee on George's neck. Yes. Okay. That I grew up in privilege in Minneapolis and St. Paul, Minnesota, in the state my family actually helped create in the 1800s. 
And so by going from the private home to the private school to the private country club and downtown to see the theater or something, I had no idea what part of town that was where the knee was on George's neck. And that stunned me and made me own again my ignorance and my ethnocentrism that as a result of such uh, separateness. When we talked yesterday, you mentioned that, I don't know if it was a summer job or you worked for the railroad for a time and that was a whole yeah, it was. I did level of job. society. I did have a job every summer in high school, of course, I just played tennis at the club, but every summer in college, I was mature enough to come back and get a job. And this job was just to experience the rest of life by working in the railroad, uh, the railroad owned by a family friend, of course. And uh, so I worked with all the other regular people who hadn't grown up that way, putting together the new telephone poles and wires after tornadoes in Minnesota. And wow, what a different life it was. The amount of money per hour and eating these, you know, steak and potato lunches at cafes in rural Minnesota, where whatever they cost, they made the receipt seem bigger than it was to get more expenses, <laughs> things like that. And I remember telling the president when I got back, you know, they do this, all this dishonest stuff. And he said, I know we have that all written into the budget. We know exactly what that is. It's all right, Lewis. Thank you for telling us. So it was <laughs> said, said the people who were living on three martini cocktails at lunch themselves. Yes, exactly. So anyway, <laughs> yeah. But I learned a lot. And it was a it was a good example for me to discover a form of diversity. Yeah. Um, my only other form of diversity growing up was my best high school friend. When I spent the night there, um, I woke up in the morning and I, I, I didn't know what this breakfast was, these locks and bagels and things like that. <laughs> <You know? laughs> he's now still a close friend and he's head of cancer surgery at UCSF in San Francisco and we're great friends, but I, I smile with him about that. Anyway, that, yeah, that's how I grew up. And so if you want me to shift to my first real life changing near death experience, or do you have another question first? No, I was just going to say, as a result of a car accident, you had the, your first NDE. Yeah, you I tell moved, us about it. Yeah, I moved. I drove across country from Boston to San Francisco because I was in love with a high school friend who was in law school at, here in San Francisco, and mm -hmm. um, so I switched from public television in Boston to public television in San Francisco, and didn't really love the job. There was some way in which I was wondering, what's my real life's purpose? I had worked two years in government, two years in a nonprofit, and now four years in public television. And I thought, well, I've done corporate government and nonprofit, but what am I gonna do when I grow up? I really didn't know. And no sooner had I felt that than I totaled my automobile in Berkeley, California, and that what I'm going to tell you now is my 100% memory of exactly what happened out of my body. Um, I was called, unlike many people who watched the accident or the surgery, that didn't happen with me in this one. I was called high speed through what we call the tunnel uh, of energy, whatever, into absolute pure light at the other end. And before I heard a voice speak to me, my experience was I am in what I call, words are never enough, but what I call the source, the absolute source of all energy, all light, all love, all spirit, all consciousness, all knowledge. It was amazing. And no part of me is acting like, oh, now I was so smart. I meant I was in the source of it all and that we were all from this source. This is our oneness at the soul level. And then we come back into the only DNA and the history of life on earth. And therein lies our human diversity of all kinds on our spectrum. So that was a major learning by itself. And then I had a voice speak to me. Not everybody has that experience. Some people call it a conversation with God, but the voice is always a voice we need to hear in our language <laughs> and whichever gender we need to hear it. So this deep male voice, probably like mine, said, Lewis, you are called here to have this conversation and to be sent back 
because you're not doing your work. And I promise you, my story about this has never changed. This is a perfect memory. But where's memory? We thought memory was in the brain and the brain was in the body and the body was in the car. So we still can't prove scientifically what this was all about. But we sure have our life experience. And in that question, I didn't know the answer to because I was raised uh, to be able to do whatever I want. So what do you mean? What keeps me from being whatever I want? I had to take it very deeply. And I got what I thought might be an answer, which is, ah, raised with that amount of privilege, I was also therefore raised with pure ethnocentrism. Ethnic, no other consciousness of any other ethnic group except my straight white way, white male Anglo wasp private privileged tribe, right? Episcopalian, you know, et cetera. And by being raised that way, I had no idea how to do any of the, what we call bridging or code switching even, to be with anybody different at all. And I started to notice <clears throat> that everybody else different than I am was doing that. And instead of me again feeling arrogant, <clears throat> it made me feel ignorant. So I was unable to relate to anybody different than my tribe. And it was in the white light in response to that question that that was my answer. And the answer of the voice was like the best line in Amadeus when Mozart hit this perfect note. Like, there it is. The answer was, there it is, Lewis. There's your work. And I was immediately sent back down without another word of how my life was going to change. And it changed immediately. Firstly, and I love sharing what we learned with these more than even the technical experience of what happened. But what I learned was, wow, doors started to open that I had nothing to do with. I didn't make it. And it wasn't even necessary for me to know how to do something when that door opened, except to be authentically present and conscious to learn and experience what, what's happening through this door. And then after I'm being with such authenticity, to go ahead and use whatever skills we each have, I had, in, I, had I have to keep them in my back pocket sort of, and be present before I start acting, speaking, and doing. That was my main lesson. And it led to my global wife and me starting the first diversity training in the US in 1982 with, as you've heard, books and videos and workshops and seminars and the National Diversity Conference I sold to SHRM, Society for Human Resource Management. And so my last 40 years has been a straight white male diversity trainer. How can that be? Since my only expertise is ethnocentrism and how to recover from it. Well, that's how. So I, I help teach others like myself, especially. I know we all need to learn it, but I'm not arrogant enough to teach you if you're not a straight white male, because that's all I know, right? So I, I facilitate and coach other white male executives to really learn to do the personal work to valuing our diversity as a gift to us, not as a legal compliance. So there's the first near death and the biggest uh, learning in life change. Right. So your audience is more receptive to your message because it's coming from their circle of friends, basically. Of course. That's great. I mean, what a great gift. I was wondering, when you were up on the other side, did you have a memory of any pre-life agreement that you'd made? I mean, had you come down to earth with the intention of doing the work you're doing? Absolutely. It, it totally changed my life and led me to know my life's purpose. And that's what I came to do. And but I mean, be, e even before you were born, they say we sometimes agree to what our life oh, is going to be you. like. No, I know I was not conscious of that, but I will never forget the day when at a workshop, a man came up to me after just hearing me speak a little. And he said, Lewis, what is it like to have a soul entirely different than the body in which you landed? And I was pretty deep and I take that in quite personally, but with no shame and no blame, therefore, I'm able to recognize 
yeah, I am at the soul level, this whatever, uh, this sensitive human spirit, you know, and I am now in this body. Mm-hmm. So I now just recognize my body, your body, her body, his body, they're just the bodies we're in. And I am, I have become aware through readings, as we call them, of two prior lives, one with my prior wife, and we went to the place where we once lived. That was amazing. And my existing daughter, who I had a life with before, and she did choose to come into this family and choose me and her mother. And I'm aware of other people who've had that experience. I have not had that experience of before coming in, why I chose that family right. and why I chose to be a yuppie wasp doing diversity consciousness <laughs> for my own self's sake. Right. <laughs> well, in theory, we are all exposed to diversity by our past lives, but of course, we don't remember them. So it doesn't serve us too much uh, use in this <laughs> lifetime. It's pretty amazing to just imagine whether you believe it or not, right? That if we had our lives in last time, neither of you listening was in the body that you're now in. That's pretty amazing. And, and I actually... I love that consciousness that I brought back, that I am just who I am. And this lifetime, I'm in this body. And this is who I am. No shame, no blame. So how can I serve? And what's my learn? What do I need to learn? And how can I serve? Well, since that time, you had two more life-threatening reminders from the other side. So tell us about those experiences. Yeah. Well, I've learned to be brief about them and go into the learning. So the and the second one was, say, after 20 years of very successfully running this company, which went from one employee to 25 to 50 and had 6,000 organizations by all of our diversity videos, there was really no competition and until about 10 years. And then there was more. And now, of course, the thousands. And yet what happened, and I'm willing, I'm comfortable to say what was chosen for me to experience <laughs> was that I totaled. Well, I I had my left frontal lobe destroyed in a white water river accident in Glacier Park, Montana, in which case a 10, 100 foot tall cottonwood tree fell off the edge of the river and landed on my head and my son's head, 10 year old son in the raft while we were going down. Now, these white waters weren't fours and fives. This is ones and twos with my 10 year old son and my 15 year old daughter. But nevertheless, the water was high and wide and fast because of prior snow melt and rain. So there were a lot of broken trees on the water. And I, I, I was supposed to have noticed that. So one of my learnings was as a straight white male athlete thinking I can do what I want. When I was told that we shouldn't go down the river today, there was too much wood on the river. I said, so what? A rubber raft doesn't hurt wood. And they said, but we're at the limit, Lewis. We can't go when it's above this limit legally. And I said, is it above this limit? And they said, no, we're at the limit. And I said, then we're going. Well, there's some, there's some white male arrogance of my own. (laughs) Okay. So, but the learning wasn't that. It was a minor learning, big enough though. The learning was that after my, uh, I was impacted with fractured skull and brain injury and blood and pus, and so was my son drowning uh, upside down, face down in the water in the raft. He was picked up, I'm told later, because I went down 20 years later, just a couple of years ago, with my same grown children to the same spot it happened, and the same guides came. That was amazing. So now I know what happened is they thought he was drowned and dead, and they knocked the water out of him. And uh, I, they thought I was dead with the tree on top of my head with my head on the edge of the rubber raft and the water running by because the roots of the tree were still holding us there. So that's physically what happened. Um, as a result, I was, I was saved by a helicopter who came and took me an hour away to uh, a hospital in Montana, but I was in a coma for eight days. Now, in this case, unlike the third near death I'm gonna tell you about where I had a total experience outside. This time, they some people say with righteousness, oh, that's not a near death experience. Oh yeah, I almost died, it should be, but I don't have an experience out of the body there. 
the experience I want to share with you that's just as spiritual and and out of body in a way is that after the coma, when I was flown back to San Francisco and begun a three-year brain injury recovery period, starting with my inability to not read or write or walk or talk or know who was visiting me in the room, my siblings, my parents, my children, friends, I'm serious. I had to start at a very, very low level to regain any of the synapses to regain the data in the library, right? In the brain. And so, including walking and talking and reading and writing. So the biggest learning I want to share with you, just as amazing as when I was in the white light, was when I was trying to walk by holding myself up on those horizontal metal bars, I realized that the body, even though the lungs and heart, et cetera, were working on their own, the functional parts of the body weren't working at all because the brain couldn't tell them how to work. But you know what I got? I, I use a metaphor, so it helps all of you, whether it's a hurricane or a tornado, whichever one you know best, you do know that at the center, they are totally still. So just to use that as a metaphor, I realized that my entire body I couldn't use anymore. It was like spinning around me dysfunctionally. I couldn't play tennis. I couldn't walk, talk, be a speaker, be a father, be a lover, be a diversity trainer. You know, I couldn't be or do anything. But you know what I got? At the core, that center of our own essence, I got, I am. And not only I am, I'm fine. It's like I, at the soul level, at the essence level, discovered that whatever else is happening to our bodies and to our life experience, we are each at the core, 100% light, love, energy, and spirit, just like the source from which we came. And that light enters us all the time through our eighth chakra and through all chakras. Call it spirit, call it soul, call it, you call it what you will. Essence, I got it, I am. And philosophers laugh and say, no, get rid of the I, Lewis, that's ego, just am. <laughs> Said I've never lost that. Yeah. So I've never lost that we all came from the same source, we're all one, and I've never lost that we're uniquely different, and I never lost that every time I look and talk to any one of you, at your core, Whatever's going on with your personality and your body and your life experience, you're just as an amazing sense and source of light and love and energy and spirit as I am. And we all are. That's a pretty deep out-of-body experience learning. Absolutely. Lewis, I have to mention the fact that Lilia, who listened to our conversation yesterday, said, she is convinced you did have an out-of-body experience when the tree hit you because when you gained consciousness of a sort, you were asking about your son, and she's sure that you had seen him from out of body, and that's why wow. you were focused so much on his well-being. Wow, that's interesting because I didn't, and, in, and I wasn't even speaking when I told you that story about when the trauma expert took me in through meditation, I was trying to regain memories of sort. And the first memory was that I'm dying, I have to try to live. That's all. That's all we do when we're trying to live. And once I realized I was alive, even though the tree was still on top of me and I couldn't talk, and the brain was fractured, my consciousness as a father started crying and wondering, where's my boy? Is he okay? And somehow she's right, somehow. I got information that he was at least alive. And that made me stop those fatherly tears and fear and love and instead switch to number three, which was, all right, I'm alive. My son's okay. My daughter's okay. And I am a wreck. How do I now recover? What do I do now? How do I recover? It's a survival skill that comes naturally from the body, mind, and spirit. That's all we do. First, we try to live, and then we try to cope with whatever condition we're in. <laughs> well, I mean, what you went through, it's a miracle that you recovered completely. Totally miracle. Totally miracle. And 
It wasn't the last one. I have a third one. No, let's go on to the third one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the third one was 20 years later. After having given up the big company and gone through all that recovery, and uh, after five years, my sensitive bipolar daughter said, ah, finally, Dad, you're the same dad. Wow. And I learned how to coach and, and do more facilitating and have individual clients. I wasn't running a company anymore, and I had to recover. But having spent 20 years in my life changing in all those ways, suddenly, in, in 2020, I was first diagnosed with stage three colorectal cancer. I mean, we all have parts of our body, don't we? And there was cancer in stage three. And they said, well, we'll have to do surgery. And I said, no, I want to do whatever's possible to kill the cancer, both your Western, your Eastern, your Western versions of chemo and radiation and whatever else I can do. And that worked successfully. But the one part I want to share with you is that in the sixth month of chemo, which is a terrible experience, I caught COVID at the hospital from the nurse giving me six months of chemo. And so I couldn't yet do the radiation. I'll tell you about that, if I remember. But I immediately felt, and this was the first one with, before any viruses, this really terrible virus. I mean, before any vaccines, excuse me, this terrible virus immediately attacks every part of you, the heart, the lungs, everything. And I could hardly breathe within a week. And But they wouldn't take me into the hospital then until I could prove to be positive with COVID. Well, the test then took a week to get results from. Wow. So by two weeks, I literally was almost dying in my home and my wife, took me to ER once I was allowed to be taken there. And they grabbed me and put me into IU, ICU immediately, intensive care. Mm -hmm. And then within a couple of days, they put me under a ventilator, even though I fought it. I said, I'm not going under a ventilator. My first cousin just died under the ventilator and we're losing a thousand people a day. And they said, well, you have to go under unless you can breathe with this technique we're giving you. And they used various masks to force air in, but I couldn't even take forced air in, much less my own. And so they took me, it's like suddenly I'm taken under the ventilator for 10 days. And for those 10 days, I was out of my body the entire time, having various experiences but I want to share with you the most potent experience of the last two days when they said to my wife one night and then the next night, I don't know if we can bring him back because his heart has failed and his lungs have collapsed. Those are different incidents on two different nights. And the heart failure was minor enough, so they were able to re-trigger it and stimulate it. But the lung collapse was serious and was not going to be able to enable me to breathe at all or live had they not done whatever they did to go in and clean out what, what the virus had done at killing everything, literally with, with you know little suction cups all the way down in your lungs. I mean, we had, we had tubes in every orifice in our body and the extra orifices they created to go in and <laughs> Oh, you should see the photos of it. It's awful. <laughs> anyway, my, my amazing experience worth sharing was that I was on a geodesic dome with hexagonal sections around it. We can sort of picture that. Picture a three-dimensional geodesic dome on, with hexagonal sections. And I and each of the others in the ICU this is how I interpret it. I didn't count them, but they were somewhere between eight or 12 at the same time under the ventilator in that ICU. And they were with me and we had all four limbs tied, in this case, to the four corners out of the six corners of the hexagonal section, just like we had been tied in the bed. So there we were, picture this dome and we're all tied with all four limbs sticking out, you know? Mm -hmm. That was 48 hours. And every second, I was just 
hanging on to live. And there was one morning, finally, the, let's see, the first of the two mornings I'm now sharing, after being there all night, when somebody came to the bottom of this dome, this sounds crazy, but this is all my experience was, and they unlocked these sections and everybody else went and flew away, which I interpret as everybody else died. Well, I don't think they all died the same second in real life, but I believe everybody else in ICU those few days did die and I was the only one living. And that part I found out was true. So there I was alone, they were all gone. And I hadn't yet found that to be good news, even though I knew they had died. I kind of, since I've died before and been in the light, I wasn't really afraid of it, but I didn't want to die. I was hanging on for that last 24 hours like you can only imagine you're hanging on a bar and you don't want to drop. And you know what that's like when it's really difficult to hold your weight up longer. No longer. No longer. Every second for 24 hours. I didn't want to die. I knew I had to come back not only to live. I love living and to breathe again. I wanted to breathe again. But to love my wife, the love of my life, finally, uh, not my first marriage. I had the mother of my two children, um, and she's alive and a friend now. But she was bipolar, like our bipolar daughter, and that's another story. But I am now with the love of my life forever, and I have to come back to be with her. And to go back to my diversity consciousness, watching that knee on George Floyd's neck, which isn't it amazing? I can say that and you all know what I mean. Just like if I said when, you know, King was assassinated or King was, or, or Kennedy was assassinated, we have total memories, all of us of those moments, okay? But watching the knee on George's neck and the other things we've seen in video since then of shootings made me realize I still have a lot of work to do with other white men. And in my case, not those who did the lynching and did the murdering. They were extremes, of course. The rest of us are just perfectly nice guys who still have some learning to do outside of our own ethnicity. Most of us anyway, no shame, no blame. It's a learning opportunity to help raise our consciousness about our oneness and to value the actual differences we bring to one another in personal relationships and in the workplace. So that's the, my life's work. And I had to come back and com complete, not complete it, to continue doing it for the rest of my life. And that's why I'm back, to love and to do that work. That's all love. It's just different levels of love, isn't it? From the boardroom to the bedroom and at the grocery store and with our siblings and our children and friends. Yeah. It's called love. And that's my life's work. One area of society that desperately needs the kind of work you're talking about is the, are the police departments. Oh, absolutely. I once worked. In fact, I can tell you it was the biggest failure of all my 40 years of training was when I was asked to fly to Texas and for three days work with the Texas Rangers. And I don't mean the baseball team. I mean, the Texas Rangers are the, the specialized police in Texas, and most of them were armed and in uniforms during three days. Well, you know, you can tell now I can talk forever, but you can't do that alone for three days. <laughs> Much less one. So I took a black female diversity expert with me, and we both failed in three days to get anywhere because of their own control and righteousness and they, they weren't open at all and when I left on the way to the airport I said that is the worst experience I've ever had tell me what was going on in that room that I made had almost no impact on and they said well maybe we should have told you before but just last week one of our officers was acquitted that's the good news 
of the murder of his wife. Ooh. Uh, he was acquitted and not guilty for murdering his wife in an accident that they thought she caused or something. And I went, oh, <laughs> listen, we all know that in every relationship, there are two of us. And that means we co-create. It's one of my greatest learnings. It only takes 30 seconds to feel the energy in ourself and in the other either get enhanced or get depleted. How's that for a learning? That took me a long time to get that down to one sentence. But it's true. And yes, the police and our prior president and Putin and a lot of individuals we know need a lot of inner personal work to reach this, the 100% light and love and spirit that we each are. Yeah. Especially if they've been trained to be other than that. And you had an experience with a ghost in an apartment that indicates that people can get stuck not only on this side of the veil, but on the other side as well. Oh, I have, you know what? I'll tell you that one and a fun one. Cause you know, that one you heard, uh, when my wife and I started our company, we started, we rent, rented some apartment. We were just two employees and we hired one employee and then two. But anyway, it was an apartment that they hadn't rented out in a while. Mm -hmm. And we did hear it was because somebody died in there. Well, we didn't, I'd already been out in the light. It didn't bother me, but it bothered a lot of people. So anyway, we took it. And we discovered very quickly that at 5.30 every late afternoon, an amazingly negative, I call it anxious energy, came rushing out of the kitchen down the little hallway toward uh, the front room. And I call it anxiety because we've all had some degree of anxiety, let's say normal degrees, when something scary happens. But this was not mine. I could tell this was extreme and it was way more than I've ever experienced. But since I'd been out in the light, I wasn't afraid of it. I could breathe and stay in my own self. But we started to notice things like the windows rattled, you know, and um, one day uh, we noticed that the roses were all hanging over the edge of their bays, uh, completely hanging over. And so we got some roses from after a wedding we attended one day. And we, we put them there again, and they, they hung over. Well, maybe they were old. So we went and bought a brand new dozen roses and put it in. And the next morning, they were all hung over, completely hanging over the edge. So there was this negative energy in that room at, that happened at 530. What else happened? We noticed once that when we said nothing other physical had moved, then a little um, framed something on the mantle didn't just fall straight. It went forward three or four feet and wow. crashed onto the floor. I'm not kidding. And the worst part, I didn't tell you yesterday because a lot of things happened, was we walked into the kitchen, one of us, and imagined that we saw red on those tiles out in the corner oh uh, sort of the tiles became red we didn't see that, that there was liquid or blood we just saw red and with we've now learned without saying anything to the other i said to my wife come down come into the kitchen tell me what you see and she walked in and went oh, there's red on the floor wow i'm not kidding and we found out that that's where he had shot himself. Now, look at, look, now you look at the floor. It's not red. It's tiles. Why did we see that? Uh, amazing. And lastly, I had my one and a half year old daughter at the time, who's the bipolar schizoaffective one that's more sensitive than even the rest of us. But she was there. And when this energy came down, she started screaming like that painting we see called the scream you know with the hands shaking and the mouth wide open yes and i had to pick her up and hold her and say it's okay it's okay it's okay ashley and i turned to the energy and said you leave my daughter alone 
I can handle your energy and you're welcome here, but please leave my daughter alone. And children, as we know, are more sensitive. And then we found out later he had shot himself in the kitchen, as I already told you, after his second wife has died, had died of cancer. So yes, there are ghosts energies around. Um, and sometimes it's fun and sometimes it isn't, depending on how open you are to it. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Well, that's certainly, have you had any other experiences similar to that? Yeah, I have. Um, I remember looking at a rented house once that nobody had rented also, and there were many ghosts in it, but I was doing that with a friend and she was looking for it. She wanted me to join her because she wasn't as secure when she heard that story, but I helped her feel like, oh yeah, they're okay though. And that was, that, that was, that was one. There have been others, but yeah, they do exist. When you talk to uh, corporations, and you've dealt with what, 6,000 corporations counseling? Oh, well, excuse me. I, yeah, I couldn't individually stand and train at all of them. Many of them, most of them were bought all of our videos and the guides and did their own training. But yes, yeah. I did go in and speak and train many, many organizations, government agencies, corporate, etc. Absolutely. Do you ever talk about the spiritual side of things? I mean, do you uh, only when that's open. I did not for about 10 years, as many of us don't. It's too strange. Or we thought then, because nobody else was talking about it then, and now they are. But uh, I had I had one experience I love sharing with you that before I had ever mentioned this in public, there was a black guy who came up to me after my workshop and he waited till everyone else is gone. You know, usually the only ones who come to talk to you are the ones who love what you did, the rest leave. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> he came up to me and he said, Lewis, I want to know how you got it. And I didn't really know how spiritual he was or, or what he was feeling. So I was, I had to be careful. And he's black, so I didn't know his history, but I had to respect that I didn't know it. <laughs> anyway, so I said, well, you know, I'm a 60s kid and I learned, from, and he cut me off right away. He said, no, no, Lewis. He said, really lovingly. Now I'm already feeling energetically what a really nice guy he is. He said, no, Lewis, that's not right. I have some white male friends and they're perfectly nice guys, and, you know, but uh -uh. You, you're getting it much more deeply than they, and, and just getting it. What does that mean? Well, I have a, I have a sense of what those words mean coming in from the light. It's not behavioral compliance. You know, it's not politeness. It's a very deep oneness, okay? And I said, well, all right, I'll tell you the spiritual part. I had this near-death experience, and I went up in the light, and on and on. I told them the whole story I told you. And afterwards, he looked at me with this great smile and wonderful love in his eyes, and he said, that's it, Lewis. All we need to do is kill all the white guys and bring them back. And he really <laughs> meant that lovingly. If that, if, we need, if they need to get hit that hard to really get it like you did. I said, I laughed with him and we just hugged. And I said, no, my job is to try to work on myself so I don't need to have so many near-death experiences <laughs> to get it and also help other white men do it so they don't need to get hit so hard. So yeah. thank you, though, for your love. <laughs> There certainly has been some progress made over the years I've been alive, but do you see some of that progress being eroded today by the renewed racism and political division in the country? Huh. How can one not see it and feel it? And it is tragic. And as, as some of us say, ah, the only good news about all of the things we've seen, including our prior president, and uh, but he's not the only one, all these incidents is that it is really uncovering how deeply unresolved all of our consciousness is about our history. Now, when I start talking about this or sharing this, I really, for myself, need to say, no shame, no blame, just notice. I love the word notice. Mm. Notice and understand and learn about our own history, how we got here. In my case, this wonderful, talented white family 
which is 14 generation all English since the Mayflower and helped create two states and three companies, et cetera. Well, they were so proud in the North that they never believed in slavery. In fact, the same entrepreneur who made all that money was a colonel in the Civil War. And they have nothing but pride. But guess what? Did I ever hear one word about what happened to all those Native Americans that called this river, this creek, the Minnehaha Creek or whatever, you know? Land of lakes, you know, land of lakes. Minnesota means Minnesota. Land of lakes. Minneapolis means city of lakes. Mm. Those are native words. So we all have histories. The Germans have histories. Africans have histories. Asians have histories. These histories aren't caused by melanin. They're caused by human, mostly maleness, of, of tribal differences and tribal violences and religious differences. So if we can just get that we all have those histories, all of us, no shame to one another, but then now we have an opportunity to really notice and own our own natural tribal discomfort with difference. You don't look like me and you don't sound like me. And instead of being afraid of that, which is natural, tribally, if you will, can go back to that part of us that still lives, you know, like any mammal that sees, you know, something that's threatening. We have to notice when that's no longer necessary. Don't worry, we're not going to lose the parts that are necessary if you're being physically violated or verbally violated or something, right? But otherwise, yes, we all have to learn. And so to answer the question, the bad news is what's happening out there, what, you know, whomever you blame it on, the good news is look what's getting uncovered and that we need to know about and clear, not block it like DeSantis in Florida and, and others who say, I'm not racist. It, it's not a shame to say I'm naturally tribally less, more comfortable with people just like myself. And we have to learn to be equally comfortable with people different. And then we get to learn to actually value some of the differences they can give us in our life experience that we otherwise wouldn't have had. And it becomes a huge gift to be able to relate across our differences and learn with one another in our oneness and in our uniqueness simultaneously. You think there would be a better uh, understanding if there weren't such an unequal uh, balance of wealth in this country? I mean, if you had blacks and whites graduating from Harvard together because they could afford to go to a a good school, wouldn't they get along much better having had the opportunities that the wealthy white people have had up till now? Not only get along, can you imagine the accomplishments that would have come from the words of the Federalist Papers and the and our you know Constitution that if we were really all educated equally and healthfully treated with health equally and fed equally. Can you imagine what this Congress would look like, this Senate, our churches, our schools, our corporations, our economy? Wow, it would be amazing. The most, it still is an amazing place, but it isn't equally so for all, and it needs to be. And yes, our history included slavery. Well, slavery even existed in Africa and still does with one tribe and slaves another. And whites enslaved whites and Asians enslaved Asians. And I say those three as major groups, but you know what? There isn't even just one race. I mean, several races. We all started in Africa, if we can believe that. And yeah. near the snow, we didn't need as much melanin to protect against as much sun, et cetera, et cetera. So if we can just get that we are all at least human, right? And we love, we live, we love, we work, we be, we serve. Oh, 
and what we can co-create together in true free enterprise, not the greed of capitalism and not the control of pure communism, but in real social enterprise with our oneness and our uniqueness as gifts we bring one another. Yes, what an amazing culture we would each live in with one another. And you've worked with some spiritual groups too. And religions, it seems to me, have been a big problem in dividing one faith from another. People who don't worship the same way or the same God. And that's a real weakness in the society too. It's astounding, you know, to hear, to take a breath and hear that Christians have actually killed more people than any other religion in the history of life on earth. Wow. Well, then what's the difference between a dogmatic Christian who thinks my answer is the right one and yours is the wrong one and I'm going to kill you? Or look what's happening in the Middle East, different Middle Eastern tribes, all Muslim, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, are Christians killing other Northern Northern Ireland, Catholics killing Protestants? You know, Jesus didn't teach any of this. So... Yes, I found when somebody asked me when I came back out of the light, are you more or less uh, religious now and more Christian? And I said, well, I'm way less dogmatic because even the religion in which I grew up in and had a wonderful Easter service on Sunday has dogma that I no longer can handle and doesn't make sense. They, of course, in all their best intention, think they're describing whatever happened with words that science can't prove. So spirit gets lost when our, when our belief in the dogma makes us dominant over someone else's dogma. That's called that religion. Whereas every religion, including non-religion, indigenous people, all start with true spirituality and oneness with earth and water and air. You know? Yeah. Seriously. The oneness, the, the, earth, the spirituality in our core that I described earlier is what we all have until it is either damaged or developed in an unhealthy way to become dogmatic and righteous. The negative use of the word righteous. <laughs> there are religions that call other religions evil. Precisely. And, uh, <laughs> what's your definition of good and evil? <laughs> That's great. My definition of good is starting with love. At our in, starting from within our core self, our natural self, like children, like puppies, kittens, and children, I'm serious, notice them. They are all being 100% authentic, which is why as a father that loved being a father, my wife still smiles every time we walk by. And my kids are now 40 and 35, and hers, my two stepchildren, are 22 and 20. When I see a little between two and six really gets me, they're still 100% aesthetic and they're brilliant, okay? That's love, that's love, okay? So for me, good is authentic, core, spiritual soul love of self and one another before there's any ability to judge at all. That's the best of good. So what I call evil, I don't, I don't think there's a devil. I don't. What I think is evil is the denial of that or the abuse of that love, uh, of that authenticity, because it leads to a behavior which is dysfunctional and destructive and becomes evil when it comes to killing what we don't need to kill. You know, when when it comes to dominating even others, when it comes to thinking that just when I meet you, another, just for me to imagine that I have power over you, because reverse that for a minute. How many of us wants to feel we have power under someone else? We don't like that. We want to be one with one another, even though we have differences of age and education and job title and whatever and skills, we can live with oneness. That's good. Evil is controlling dominance over others that's abusive, not appropriate control to drive the car and stay in that lane, 
I'm talking about inappropriate control <laughs> and dominance. That's evil. Lewis, we are sadly out of time, but I want to thank you so much for sharing your NDEs with us today and, and how orders from God established your career in organizational healing. Tell folks how they can find your website and, and uh, your books. Well, my old diversity website is just griggs at griggs.com, G-R-I-G-G-S. My email is lewis, L-E-W-I-S, at griggs.com if you want to email me. But more up-to-date is my LinkedIn website page, Lewis Brown Griggs, or Griggs Productions, the company name. And my YouTube page is Griggs Productions, in which case you can see on my YouTube page all my NDE workshops, uh, all my diversity, several of my diversity interviews, workshops, and all the 23 videos I made on diversity are now there free because they were made in the 80s and 90s and people just won't pay $600 each for them anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but they can learn just as well. Absolutely. They were as, way ahead of their time. There's much learning. You get to go watch them free on my YouTube page. Lovely. <laughs> if listeners would like to hear this show again or any of our more than 490 archived ad-free NDE interviews, go to Talk Zone's NDE radio site and hit the past shows button or go to our YouTube channel, NDE Radio with Lee Whitting, where you can subscribe to and comment on the complete NDE radio library. And be sure to check out our NDE Radio Facebook page. Just search NDE Radio with Lee Whitting on your Facebook app. Listen again next Monday, 11 a.m. Eastern at Talk Zone for more NDE Radio. I'm your host, Lee Whitting, saying thanks for listening.